I'm going to talk about bone targeted agents in metastatic prostate cancer, particularly denosumab, the bisphosphonates and radium 223. Uh, this is a depressingly familiar site in, uh, in our practice where we have a patient who presents uh, with uh, a lesion like this, multifocal lesions in the spine, the pelvis, a super scan, and so on. When uh, prostate cancer gets into the bones, it is unfortunately uh, unstoppable, and it is what patients die from. Uh, most patients have uh, bone metastases at the time of death, and uh, a proportion of them have this as the only site of their disease. And uh, one of the problems that we all fear um, is the skeletal-related event, a pathological fracture, a pain in bone called compression, uh, and so on. And if you measure bone resorptive indices, um, and NTX is a, is a breakdown product of collagen, you can look at this in relation to different cancers, prostate, breast, myeloma, non-small cell lung, and others. Now, it might surprise you that if you take myeloma um, here in yellow, it's nothing like as resorptive as prostate cancer here which is the most resorptive cancer we know. So, yes, it's osteoblastic, but it's also osteolytic, and that's why you get the bone destruction. So, what do we do and what do we have available to delay SREs in metastatic prostate cancer? Well, there's the older data relating to zoledronic acid. Zoledronic acid is the most potent uh, anti-osteoclast agent we have in the bisphosphonate field, and uh, Fred Saad's study, published in 2002, showed very clearly that there was a, about an 11% reduction in skeletal-related events, and particularly um, it halved the rate of cord compression and of pathological fracture. It's still used. It's still a very valuable drug. Denosumab is a more powerful agent, is easier to give, and in this uh, study, which was a large-scale randomized trial, randomizing denos denosumab and placebo, to zoledronic acid and placebo, what this showed was that the denosumab uh, was even more powerful than the zoledronic acid. So zoledronic acid, about an 11% reduction in, uh, in SREs. Uh, these are radiological and uh, clinical SREs. And the denosumab added another 18% risk reduction to that. Now, the problem with these drugs is that they will slow down the normal bone production so they slow down this uh, osteoblastic and osteoclastic replacement process. And if you give these drugs for too long or in too high a dose, one of the complications you get is osteonecrosis of the jaw. Um, so if you're going to give these drugs, you probably shouldn't be giving them for longer than two years. And so you have to gauge when to start with these. Now, the other thing which has um, uh, been used for many years, actually, uh, are radionuclides in uh, prostate cancer. This is the uh, first uh, ever report of um, the use of radionuclide in prostate cancer, 1964, uh, using radioactive phosphorus. And we've got a bit more sophisticated about all this because we now have bone-seeking radionuclides, which are um, either beta emitters or alpha emitters. So these are either calcium analogs, like strontium and radium, or they're attached to phosphate, such as samarium, rhenium, uh, and uh, phosphor radioactive phosphorus itself, uh, phosphorus 32. Now, just to explain a key difference between these two types of compounds. Now, a beta emitter, um, with strontium, samarium, and all the rest, apart from radium, um, they uh, are um, effective over much larger distances, but as you can see from these particle uh, bubble chamber pictures here, um, the amount of energy that they distribute in their passage is much smaller. So the DNA uh, hits per cell kill need to be very high when you're using a beta emitter. And the DNA damage is much more easily repairable. Um, an alpha particle, by contrast, distributes its energy over a much shorter distance, and it distributes it in a much bigger hit. So you only need one to four hits of an alpha uh, emitter to produce the sort of DNA damage which produces cell kill and which is irreparable. Now, if we look at the data from beta-emitting radionuclides, there's quite a body of this. Mostly, uh, these trials are relatively small in number. Um, 126 patients here, um, 
152 patients there from Oliver Sartor's group, um, mainly in the prostate, but some of these data are from prostate and breast. And pain responses, very well documented. Effective drugs, um, 30 to 60% uh, reduction in pain, um, complete responses in pain here, partial responses in pain here. But mostly, uh, these are not durable responses, and they don't have an effect on survival. This is a much more sophisticated study, which was run uh, by, uh, with uh, Nick James as the senior investigator. This was the trapeze study combining dostaxel um, with a combination of strontium uh, and uh, uh, prednisone and dostaxel, prednisone, and zoledronic acid with strontium. What that showed is that there was a small but insignificant improvement in survival with this combination. This is the uh, strontium-89 comparison, and uh, this small but uh, clinically insignificant improvement. But what it did show was what had been shown previously in Fred Saad's trial when we looked at the zoledronic acid comparison here, a significant improvement in, in the interval for skeletal-related events with a hazard ratio of 0.74, really confirming in a, con a, a much larger controlled trial setting that zoledronic acid <coughs> and these related drugs are very effective in reducing skeletal-related complications and should be considered. The important distinction between the Alcimca trial and the earlier zoledronic acid and denosumab trials was the definition of the skeletal-related event. Um, this was defined as a clinical SRE. In other words, the patient had to have radiation to bone, pathological fracture, spinal cord compression, or surgery to bone. And most of these patients were symptomatic. Um, if you look at the uh, patients, uh, you get a feel for what they were like um, in terms of the extent of the disease. There were some performance status two patients, not uh, uh, about 13% in both arms. Um, you can see that uh, the majority had a very heavy skeletal load of disease. And as I mentioned, a substantial number of them had bone pain, um, over half of them. Uh, when we look at the patient characteristics in relation to alkaline phosphatase, um, you can see there was quite a range, but uh, as I emphasized um, in relation to skeletal load, uh, uh, an alkaline phosphatase of 6,500, you really know a patient is in trouble when you see that, and particularly when it's associated with a high LDH level. Um, about half of the patients had received uh, prior dose taxol, and about 40% uh, had received prior bisphosphonates. I'll come back to that because that's an important point. Now, what was a bit of a surprise to us all, I think, and even to the investigators, uh, was that this regimen produced an improvement in overall survival. A median of 3.6 months, relatively modest, but bear in mind that this uh, kind of improvement in overall survival has resulted in the use of dostaxel and the adoption of uh, enzalutamide and abiraterone in this setting. And this occurred across all the subgroups. When you look at the forest plot, substratifying for differences in alkaline phosphatase, current use of bisphosphonates, prior dose taxol use, and so on, uh, they're all um, on the correct side, the positive side of the equivalence line. So when we look at the um, prior dose taxol use, we can see uh, that in the, um, the uh, patients treated with dose taxol and those with no prior dose taxol use, radium was superior in both circumstances. And then we come to the skeletal related events. And remember, we're not just looking at survival in this patient group. You really want to avoid a cord compression, a pathological fracture, and so on. And there's a substantial improvement uh, in the time to the first clinical skeletal related event here. But there's a twist to this, and that is that if you substratify those patients and you look at patients who had concurrent use of bisphosphonate and those who had no current use of bisphosphonate, there was a loss of the effect in relation, in relation to SREs. So, so the important message here is that if radium-223 is going to be used, and if it's going to be used to prevent skeletal-related events, then it's better to give it with a bisphosphonate. There's no data on denosumab, but my guess is, and it is a guess, um, that it will probably be the same.
what were the adverse events? Well, the patients get a little bit of diarrhea. Uh, there are some GI upsets, and uh, part of the problem there is that radium is eliminated via the gut. If you look at this baseline study here, um, you can see a very nice delineation of the colon there with excretion of radium 2G3. Um, we have some updated data in relation to all this. Uh, this is uh, the US Extended Access Program uh, looking at pain. And uh, this was uh, um, from uh, GUASCO 2015. And uh, what you can see here is as this is changed from baseline in pain amongst patients not on opioids at, uh, opioids at baseline. So cycle two, day one, cycle four, day one, and you can see clearly that the patient's pain requirements are going down. Um, when we look at uh, the effects of um, uh, SREs um, in other agents, uh, and I, I'll take you through this now with abiraterone, um, we know that if we've got an effective drug, it will drop the cancer effect, and that, in turn, will have a reduction in SREs. This is the uh, Lancet Oncology paper um, with the uh, 301 analysis looking at SREs uh, from Christopher Logothetis, and you can see abiraterone acetate and prednisone was better at reducing SREs, and it was also uh, better at changing the pain requirements, as we might expect. And the same has been seen uh, with uh, enzalutamide. Now, I've shown you these slides, really, to introduce uh, this paper, uh, which was uh, published uh, in Lancet Oncology uh, in July this year. This is radium-223 and concomitant therapies in patients with metastatic castrate-resistant <coughs> prostate cancer. It uh, was uh, an international early access, open-label, single-arm trial. And I emphasize that it's open label, single arm, because you have to be a bit careful about interpreting the data uh, in a study like this. So if we look at overall survival uh, in these patients treated with concomitant use of abiraterone and or enzalutamide with radium-223, uh, what we can see here is that enzalutamide and abiraterone or no enzalutamide or abiraterone in the blue that there seems to be an additive effect of the agents given together. That's radium-223 and the novel androgen deprivation. And if we look at that with concomitant use of denosumab, we see a similar sort of pattern. These are the radium-223 only patients. These are the combination patients. So there is a suggestion, um, and it is, uh, um, you have to be careful, as I said, interpreting this kind of data, there is a suggestion that the two agents given together might have a benefit on overall survival. Uh, I think what we can say with a degree of confidence uh, is that it's safe to give these agents together. So finally, when we consider bone-targeted agents in metastatic prostate cancer, what do we know? Well, we have active drugs. They are available. They are available for use. I think in many practices they are underused and it's quite safe to give them in combination, and those combinations seem to provide benefit, not only in terms of survival in some circumstances, but actually in reducing that most feared of complications, uh, cord compression, pathological fracture, and severe bone pain. We need to keep working at this. It is an area of prostate cancer which is fundamentally important. Um, we need to understand the biology, uh, but I would... Uh, entreat you to consider using these agents a bit more often than they are currently used. Thanks very much.